Okay, so thank you very much for the opportunity to be here to present the paper, not to mention all the other things. Um, okay, so this paper, by the way, with uh, Salvatore and uh, Thomas, who are here and are going to answer to all the uh, tough questions. Um, okay, so let me start with a little bit, a little bit of introduction. Um, most uh, free rider papers have an important, very important dynamic component. Think about uh, pollution problems, uh, but even like uh, public goods uh, typically are uh, um, durable, so they, they persist in a long, for a long period and they, it takes time to accumulate them. And um, uh, now despite this, uh, I think uh, uh, there is only a limited understanding of dynamic free rider problems, and I hope that the paper and the presentation today will convince you of that, of this. So uh, there is a literature uh, that has studied uh, dynamic free rider problems in the sense of dynamic public good accumulation in uh, free rider environments um, uh, from the 90s. And this literature um, basically, first of all, it focuses on specific environment, typically it's like differential games with quite specific utilities, quadratic utilities. But most importantly, it's uh, uh, focused on uh, environment with reversibility. Uh, environment with reversibility are environment where basically you can accumulate a good, a public good, and you can decumulate it whenever you want. So it's like you make a bridge, and then you decide, in fact, uh, you're hungry, so you can eat a piece of it. You can transform it back in whatever was the original uh, input. And of course, this is not uh, true in many environments for technological reasons, like when you construct a bridge or something like that, typically you cannot revert the process. Or, and it, or it's not true also for legal reasons. If you donate a painting to a, a museum, uh, typically you can't take it back or like you can take a piece of it back. So, <coughs> but there is really no uh, analysis of the classical free rider problems uh, when you have irreversibility. So the, the paper I'm going to present today is an attempt to, to provide a framework to, to study uh, free rider problems with and without reversibility. Now, the, at the core of the paper, <coughs> there's really a methodological uh, uh, approach. Uh, and I'll try to explain it, and I'll try to, I mean, the presentation will be focused on this. Uh, it's a really a new approach, I think, to, to, to analyze uh, um, stochastic games or this type of games. And, and, and it's an approach that, as you will see, is general enough. You can probably use, you, for sure, you can use in other environments as well, uh, with other type of decision processes as well. So uh, basically, essentially, the idea is to characterize the weakly concave equilibria. And it may seem like uh, nothing particularly sp special at this point, but you'll see the weakly concave equi uh, uh, equilibria, that is, uh, equilibria with weakly concave value function of a particular property and will be uh, specific. Um, th this property will be important to, to kind of get the full picture of the possible outcomes that you can get in equilibrium. And then show that this is without loss of generality in terms of characterizing the steady states of the system of the economy that we are studying. So this will be the idea. And the, the, the basic results, I can summarize them in three bullet points. Essentially, whenever you, when, if you have reversibility, you will have a continuum of equilibria. And uh, uh, you, in the middle of this set of equilibria, uh, a continuum of equilibria with a continuum of steady states you will have an equilibrium that you get in autarky, that is in a situation where you are alone. This means that being in a community could be good in the sense that you can achieve more, or it could be bad, depending on the equilibrium, you can achieve less. Moreover, as you increase the population, the best equilibrium will become better and better, the worst equilibrium will become worse and worse. Um, it's also interesting that the best equilibrium, you will get efficiency as delta goes to 1. It will be efficient in the limit as delta goes to 1. And this is achieved with a mark of equilibrium. So with no punishment of the type of uh, individual behavior, uh, and just with strategies that will, will, uh, will depend only on the state variable. Whenever you have irreversibility, uh, things will be very different. Uh, the equilibrium set will be a subset uh, of the original one, and when depreciation is small, you, uh, the equilibrium converges to a singleton. So as, as depreciation D is that of the public good goes to zero, the set uh, shrinks to a singleton, which is the best possible equilibrium you can achieve with the reversibility. So, and this is interesting because in a planner problem, uh, having reversibility versus irreversibility is irrelevant. It doesn't matter, it doesn't change the, the steady state, which is unique. Uh, there is another set of results that I'm not going to emphasize today because I don't have time. But basically, you can construct equilibria 
uh, where you don't have a steady state, where you have cycles. This is a model with no shocks whatsoever. You, will have, but you can have equilibria where, where the state uh, keeps cycling forever. Or you can have equilibria where the state converges to a steady state, but uh, through spiraling loops, basically like uh, going around it. Uh, so you can have a very interesting phenomena. But I'm not going to talk about it today. <coughs> All right. So here is the plan for today. I'm going to describe the model, uh, which is very simple in some sense. It's kind of very uncontroversial, I think. Uh, describe the planner solution, which give you, will give you a framework to think about uh, the, the, how to approach the problem. And then uh, equilibrium with reversibility, reversibility. Maybe I'll mention, I'll talk a little bit about non-monotonic strategies and cycles, and I conclude. All right, so here is the model. Now, the economy. We're going to have an economy with N agents um, uh, and two goods. Uh, the agent, the good is the private consumption and, the, and a public good, G. Uh, the utility of the agents uh, is uh, standard quasi-linear, uh, linear in the private consumption and concave uh, standard you know, utility function, generic utility function for, for G, for the public good. Um, the rate of transformation between the private good and public good is one, so simple technology. Uh, the important uh, assumption is that the, the public good is a, uh, is a stock, is a capital, and uh, it can be accumulated. So the level of the public good at time t will be 1 minus depreciation d of the level of yesterday, t minus 1, plus the overall investment in today in this economy. Uh, as I anticipated, we're going to have two environments, one with the reversibility and one with the reversibility. And a reversible economy is an economy where Basically, you have that consumption cannot be negative, uh, weekly positive. The public good cannot be negative. And uh, you have an aggregate uh, um, resource constraint that says that the sum of consumption plus the total investment that you have in the public good um, is lower or equal than some uh, resources that you have in every period. I'll use the notation here um, of G to say to for G t minus 1, that is the state, the level of G with which you start the period and y for gt, which is the new level that you choose today. Because it's a Markov equilibrium, so we get rid of the subscript. So g is the state, y is the, the control variable, the variable you control. So this is the investment, is the new level minus the, pres the depreciated level of yesterday, so it's the net investment plus consumption, and this is the endowment of the economy, w, which is constant. In every period you have w. In an irreversible economy, same thing, but now, y must be larger or equal to 1 minus dg because you can't directly reduce it. So the stock can go down because of depreciation, but you can't directly reduce it. So you do a bridge, uh, you can leave it there so it depreciates, but you can't uh, take, a, take pieces back and, and eat it. Uh, you, it's just uh, unfeasible. This is the irreversible economy. So, you know, environment, you, you can have environments and examples of, uh, in both types. It really depends on technology and uh, in institutional environment. So if you have a, uh, so if the public good is like a, the Amazon forest, uh, you may think that uh, you can contribute to it, or you can go in there and steal it. Uh, depending on the technology, you may be able to steal it or may not be able to do it. So it really depends on the environment you want to describe, uh, what kind of case you want to have. But I would say that if you're talking about physical investments, this irreversibility constraint is an important component of uh, the environment. All right, so how do we choose the level of Y? Um, we have that each agent is endowed with W over N uh, of uh, endowment to, to be allocated uh, and chooses how much to consume and how much to contribute to the public good that by simply donating it, donating the public good. So independently, they choose how much to consume and how much to donate uh, for the public good. Uh, so in, a, in an irreversible economy, consumption can be low, must be lower or equal than this endowment, of course, because you can't withdraw from the public good. In a reversible investment economy, you can consume your endowment and then you can take one over n of whatever is the stock that is there. You can just steal it, basically. <coughs> so the economy-wide investment will be the sum of all these investments. So essentially now the, 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 the g uh, is the state variable in this economy and uh, will, be, will create a, a dynamic linkage between across policy making periods in this case. Because by choosing G, you affect the utility today, but also you're going to affect the behavior and the expected value function in the future. So we're going to focus on Markov equilibria here. So equilibria where basically the strategies depend only on the state variable. 
Um, and it's going to be symmetric because it's a symmetric environment. And we're going to also assume continuous strategy. So we're going to prove existence, of course, and focus on equilibria with continuous strategy and therefore continue value function as well. All right, so let me try to explain the, how a planner would approach this problem. And this will give you a framework kind of to understand also where we're going with equilibrium. Um, now, the planner's problem is relatively straightforward. Uh, it's a standard uh, dynamic programming <coughs> problem. The planner, uh, this is a utilitarian planner. The planner maximizes the sum of utilities here. He has a bunch of constraints, the resource constraints, the non-negativity constraints. And it simply you know, chooses the, the consumption vector and the investment to, do, to maximize this problem. Um, this is a standard, as I said, problem. You can show that the value function is uniquely defined, uh, is concave, uh, differentiable, uh, and so on and so forth. You have all the properties you, you, you'd like. In fact, uh, uh, the, in this problem, because it's so simple, it can be easily characterized with the geometric analysis. And I'm going sh to show it to you, starting from the reversible investment economy. Now, look at this. This is the objective function. And as I said, in the unique equilibrium, uh, there, this is concave. So this is going to be a concave objective function, standard objective function. So we can represent it like this. So this is like you have to choose y. The planner has to choose y, essentially. Uh, the consumption will be the residual. Uh, this is the, the, the objective function. He has a trade-off because consuming today gives you a utility of one at the margin. This consumption is quasi-linear utility. And the benefit is going to be this concave uh, sum of the today and the future. So it's concave. He faces, the planner faces, he or she, uh, the, the, a budget constraint, an aggregate, aggregate budget constraint. It's, the investment cannot be ma larger than the, the entire resources of the economy. So you see in this case, uh, very simple, uh, he has an increasing objective function. He, he's going to choose a corner solution. He's going to invest everything here. Uh, there's a constant marginal cost, and uh, a, a concave benefit, and so at the beginning, he just wants to invest as much as possible. So because of this, this is going to grow. And then at some point, it's going to become larger so that this, so large that this peak here is becoming feasible. At that point, he's not going to invest anymore. It's going to stop. So the investment function will look very simple like this. So invest everything at the beginning. Keep investing. This is here. We have G as, uh, as, a, as a variable. So the, as you increase the state, you can afford more and more. And then at some point, you can afford this point here. This is this level. And then you stop. If you have more, if G is larger than this, you can afford this. Plus, you can consume all the rest. And just you, you don't invest anymore because at the margin, there is no benefit to do that. Uh, you can, in fact, characterize this function in closed form. You know, this is kind of an envelope theorem you can approach, you can use. And so you can get the formula, basically, of this level. So the planner is going to be in, in one of two situations at this point. The steady state may be here like this or like this. This is a situation in which basically depreciation is so high that the planner just cannot, uh, cannot uh, uh, invest fast enough to arrive to whatever is the optimal level. So it's just impossible to arrive to the, to the satiation point, point because the depreciation pushing back so, much, so fast. This is a situation in which you can, you arrive here, you stop, and then at this point here, you just pay for depreciation in every period. This will be always the case if you have zero depreciation. So uh, it, 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 the cases depend simply on the, on, the, on the fundamentals of the economy, just the, the, the parameters. And we're going to focus on this case. So I'm going to call it this a regular economy and just uh, co focus on this case. It's just without loss of general. You can do this case. It's trivial. It's just uh, to, to have a simpler focus on a simpler case. All right, so if you have irreversibility, what happens? Really nothing for the planner. Irreversibility means that it's going to be a constraint. You cannot go below this line. So whenever you arrive at this point, you simply rectify the investment function. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change the expected value. This is out of equilibrium. It doesn't disturb the maximization problem. It just uh, simply it says if you have too much, then you can't reduce it. You, you must be there, remain there. And then, of course, you're going to converge back to the, whatever is the steady state. It doesn't really change anything, not, neither in the convergence, not in the steady state. All right, so it's irrelevant. And that's the reason why I think in the literature it's been a little bit ignored, the, the, the issue of reversibility versus irreversibility. Now, what happens in an equilibrium? Let's start with the reversible case. Um, all right, so first of all, what, who is deciding here? Uh, the, we don't have a centralized authority. Each agent individually decides, chooses how much to consume and how much to contribute. Because of this, nobody is really choosing why, because why is the sum of all the contribution. 
um, the, but essentially, an agent in equilibrium, he controls Y at the margin because he knows in a pure strategy equilibrium what the others are doing, and he knows that he can invest a little more, a little less, so he can control Y at the margin. So there is no loss of generality, in basically, in assuming that he's choosing X and Y in equilibrium. Uh, of course, he faces a bunch of constraints. What are these? This is simply a rewriting of the previous constraints. This is the resource constraint. Uh, this is the non-negativity of consumption, and this is simply the fact that cons the aggregate consumption cannot be larger than overall uh, resources. So no negativity of the investment of the of the Y, uh, of the of, of the overall investment. Yes, so it's just a resource constraint. Too. Um, all right. So you want to maximize this thing. Now you, we can simplify a little bit this problem because in equilibrium, in a symmetric equilibrium, the consumption level of the others. Uh, is going to be 1 over n of the aggregate equilibrium investment. Uh, from my point of view as, as, a, as a decider here, I take this as given. So for me, this, it, I can just substitute the x with this thing. And basically, I can represent everything in terms of y. This is just algebra. It's not particularly important. But just to, the, you can represent the problem in a very simple way. This is like very similar to the planner's problem. You maximize an objective function. You have a trade-off of consumption gets a benefit of 1. And now a benefit that is a u plus delta v. The only difference with the planner, is, there are two differences with the planner. One is we don't have n in front of this stuff. And this is because of the free rider problem. Uh, you don't internalize the benefit on the others. You care all, only about yourself. The value function is going to be different. It's going to be the equilibrium value function, not the, the, the planner. Uh, and you have constraints that simply say that given what the others are doing, you can achieve only so much in terms of y. And then uh, you can, in fact, reduce y only so much because uh, in this case, uh, uh, there is always the investment of the others that you can't control. Anyway, so what you do, given the value function, you solve this as a maximization problem. And of course, uh, um, given the solution, you can find the value function. Because in expectation, uh, my value function is not going to be the solution of this maximization problem. It's going to be whatever I expect the others are doing. Yeah, in, terms, in terms of the equilibrium strategies. And then I know in a symmetric equilibrium, I'm going to get 1 over n of anything that is left, essentially. So an equilibrium, a mark of equilibrium, is going to be um, a, a collection of functions such that uh, the policies solve this problem given the value function, and the value function solves this functional equation given the strategies in equilibrium of the others. So it's a fixed point, uh, as usual. All right. The problem here is that, contrary to the case of the planner, we have no knowledge a priori about how V looks like. Uh, we don't know if it is concave, not concave. In fact, typically, it's not going to be concave. Um, it, we don't know anything, essentially. So we need to kind of uh, try to, both to prove existence, but in particular to, prove, to characterize the set of equilibria, we need to be able to say something about this. <clears throat> so the approach, as I said, I'm going to first postulate that this is weakly concave, that function. The objective function is going to be weakly concave. I'm going to characterize the equilibria, what I can achieve there. And then I'm going to tell you that you can do more than that. Now, why weakly concave is important? Let me spend some time here, because this is basically the core of the paper. It's the kind of the approach. Uh, and I'll try to convince you that it's an approach that can be applied in general in dynamic uh, uh, problems. Now, if the objective function is weakly concave, then we must have uh, some flat region like this. This seems kind of a weird uh, case. It seems a little bit of a knife edge. It's not going to be knife edge. In fact, most equilibria uh, are going to be of this type. So all right, so wh wh what do you do if you are in this? So suppose you are in this situation, and let's analyze the problem of how you would choose your reaction function to this objective function. Now, again, you, there is a resource constraint. If I am in this situation, it's like a planner. Here, I can uh, afford up to this point. This is increasing, so I get a corner solution. Not difficult. All right, so then in this case, uh, again, this is going to move to the right. I keep in investing. At some point, um, I'm going to be able to achieve the peak of the mountain. Now, the peak is an entire plateau, so there's an, a, a lot of choice there. But it may not matter. So once I'm here, I can choose the corner here, and I'm happy because that's the maximum. But I don't necessarily need to do that. Because at this point here, I'm free to choose any point I, I want on the, on, the, on the top. So my reaction function can take a more general uh, form. So essentially here, this says that as g increases, I'm increasing the state. More and more things are feasible. At the beginning, it doesn't matter because I have a corner solution. At some point, 
I have choice, but I still remain at the corner here, so I have a constant thing. But at some point, as I increase the state, I have more and more feasibility, I actually start to walk on top of the mountain. And it's flat, so it's optimal. I can do it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's allowed. So I can start to increase my investment, increase, increase, increase. At some point, uh, the G passes this point here. Here, I don't want to increase it anymore, so then I stop it, and I stop here. And then I get something of this type. Now, what is important here is that because it's flat, I have more freedom to choose my reaction function. It's a little bit like what you have in a mixed strategy equilibrium. The difference is that this is in a dynamic intertemporal uh, uh, framework. Uh, I'm indifferent because future behavior, not contemporaneous behavior of the, in the mixed strategy equilibrium, is going to make me indifferent. And because I'm indifferent, I can choose, uh, uh, my, uh, I have more freedom to choose my reaction function. <clears throat> the problem is that well, this is an optimal reaction function. It's not necessarily an equilibrium, because in equilibrium, I need to have that this shape is going to give me the flat uh, mountain here. Otherwise, I cannot uh, uh, sustain this equilibrium. So, all right, so now I want to explain you what kind of conditions we need to satisfy, uh, what kind of condition this green line needs to satisfy in order to get close the model and get an equilibrium and get a flat uh, top. Let's think about it. Now, if I have a flat top, I need to have that the, at the top of the mountain, the derivative is zero. I can do the derivative without loss of generality because I'm going to prove that it's actually differentiable. So basically, remember, the objective function was uh, u plus delta v minus y. So if this is flat in, in my region, top region, I must have something like that. OK. What else do I know? Well, I know that the value function in equilibrium must satisfy this functional equation here. In expectation, I get 1 over n or whatever uh, is left there. So I can differentiate this expectation, and I get another differential uh, derivative. But now I can use the first one and insert it in the second. So I do this, and I get some, a little more elaborate equation. <coughs> so what do I know? This is a necessary condition, necessary condition, in order to have a flat top. What do I know here? Well, some things I, I know because they are, uh, by assumption, these are, these are the primitives of the model. U is a primitive of the model. I can differentiate. I'm assuming it's differentiable. Y, I don't know it, and Y prime certainly don't know it, but I don't really care because that's what I want to find. That's my variable I need to find. The only problem here is this last <coughs> term here. Because you see, I have V prime here, but it's evaluated at Y of G. Here, this formula just tells me what happens at g, not at y of g. And I don't know. So I need to get rid of this part in order to have a, a condition that I can use. Well, but let's look at the picture that we just showed. What happens here? What is a property that is happening here? <clears throat> well, if you notice, once I am in this set here, which is the flat region, part is a subset of the flat region, I never go out. If I'm inside here, this is g. Y of G is here. Well, it's also inside this region here. So if the, the, the objective function is flat at G, it's going to also be flat at Y of G. Because of this property that this is a, is, is a stable steady state. So whenever I'm close to it, I'm going to still be close to it. And if it is flat, I'm go it's going to be flat again. So then I can use this formula again twice. And I insert it here. And now I end up with a differential equation that I can solve. And I have a condition that is going to be necessary and must be satisfied by my investment function in equilibrium. Now, OK, but this is nice because, well, this is a necessary condition, but this will give me a continuum of solutions. Because you know, I, uh, depending on, on the initial point, I can find the, a variety of these equations. And this is what creates the continuum of equilibria. Now, if I want to achieve an equilibrium with a steady state here, then I just impose that it passes through this point, and I get a unique solution for this. But they don't need to have only this steady state. I might have a, a, a other, others. In fact, this rich, uh, richness of, the, uh, of construction will give me a variety of, uh, uh, of possibilities. Um, so the question then is, what can I achieve in terms of steady states? I'm just, I'm, I showed you a key step in the construction of the equilibria. The, que the question is, how can, I, can I fix the, the rest and construct the entire equilibrium? And, what, and for what steady states can I do it? So is, is there loss of generality to do this or not? Like maybe I, I'm missing something. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to focus now uh, here on monotonic equilibria. Monotonic equilibria are equilibria where the value function is non-decreasing in G. 
There are always uh, 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 non-monotonic equilibria always exist. Uh, this is something we prove, but I'm not going to talk about it uh, today. But it's not important because in terms of when you compare the steady states, with the non-monotonic equilibria are going to give you only some bad uh, uh, steady states, essentially. So the qualitative results will be, are the same. So the first result I'm going to show you, I'm, I'm not going to show you, but I'm going to state, is that, in fact, uh, uh, if you take a point Y0R in this interval here, then uh, this is going to be a steady state. And if it is a steady state, it must be in this, in, in this set. So this is a necessary and sufficient condition to have an, uh, an equilibrium steady state in a monotonic equilibrium uh, of the game that we've seen before. So what do we learn from this formula here? It's not really important the closed form particular uh, shape of these things, um, but it's really the, the qualitative mess, uh, results that are interesting. <coughs> so let me list some of them. Um, so first of all, all equilibria are inefficient. This is, should not be surprising. This is something also the bottom line of the entire literature on, on Freerider. Uh, perhaps more interesting is the fact that the outer key, uh, steady state, is always in the interior of, of this set. So what is the outer key state? Well, it's a situation in which you are alone. You don't get the benefit from the others, but the others don't get to steal your stuff. You are in a little island, you're on, on, on your own. Do you like that or not? Well, the result says that it depends on what in which equilibrium you are. If you are in, the, in a good equilibrium, so say in the best equilibrium, then you like it because you can achieve more. And the reason is because you can have equilibria where investment functions sustain each other. There is a complementarity in the investment. The more I invest, the faster the others are investing. And so this kind of helps us sustain a higher level of steady states. You can have, however, equilibria in which the opposite is true, in which the more people there are, the less we do. And in fact, we can go have a steady state that is lower than the steady state you would achieve in outer key. And the reason is because the more I invest, the more the others are substituting my investment. Uh, and so you have a substitutability, sub strategic substitutability, essentially. The, it's also interesting the fact that as n, goes to as n increases, uh, these two extremes uh, don't shrink, but they expand. So this phenomena become more and more, more stronger and stronger. Also, this multiplicity does not disappear <coughs> as n goes to infinity. The set is actually is, is well defined even in the limit. And the, the, the continuum of equilibria is there even in the limit. The multiplicity disappears only in the static version, where delta is equal to zero. In that case, you have a unique equilibrium, as you have in a static environment. Finally, the final result, which I find quite remarkable, is the fact that as delta goes to one, the highest steady state is the efficient level. So you might be con concerned that, you know, these formulas, this is like maybe you can't achieve very much. No, you can achieve anything you could achieve. This is the efficient level as delta goes to one. And this is achieved just with these strategies that are always forward looking. It's Markov. There is no punishment uh, of in the form of, uh, uh, you know, individual trigger strategies or something like that. Okay, so these are the, basically the key proper. Oh, so let me just say, I'll say it later. If you allow for non-monotonic equilibria, same thing is true, same upper bound you have, the lower bound is a little lower. That's the only difference. And, and on top, you have a more complicated convergence. But today, we're talking about the steady states only. Can I, can I ask one more? So the, the, the efficient level is a steady state. Although it doesn't cost you, it doesn't make any sense in terms of welfare, but do you know anything about the path? The path, yes, yes. I, I was going to talk about it when I, when I talk about uh, the, uh, the irreversible case. Okay, the, the path is inefficient, uh, is, is inefficiently slow. Of course, as delta goes to one, it doesn't matter. But, but, yeah, but, yeah. but this uh, is definitely a property of that. All right, so just to, how much time do I have? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Yes. Okay. All right, so this is the case of reversible economies. <coughs> now, let's go to irreversibility. Um, so let, let's start with the equilibrium we have just seen, and let's ignore the irreversibility constraint. <coughs> this is the, more or less the equilibrium we, have, we had before. Now let's imagine that depreciation is zero, just for simplicity. So, so here clearly we are violating uh, irreversibility because uh, irreversibility says you cannot go below the 45 degree line. Okay? Um, and, so, and here we, we are going below that. So all right, so let's, say, let's do what we did uh, for the planner's case. Uh, let's rectify this thing. Simply, whenever you violate it, you just fix it and you, you bring it up. Uh, if you have something like this, and if this were an equilibrium, then uh, you get uh, the same, the same behavior would be true because this part is all out of, equilibrium, 
out of equilibrium. Once you're here, you converge to this point, the steady state, you stay there. Now, the problem is that this is not going to be an equilibrium anymore, uh, differently from what happens in the planner's case. In the planner's case, even when d is equal to zero, if you do something like this, it's still going to be an equilibrium. And maybe I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. Um, but well, what's happening here? Why, why this is not an equilibrium? What, what is the economic intuition? Well, the reason is that the reason why the red line is an equilibrium is, is because at this point you want to stop because you, you know that if you invest more, it's going to be eaten by the others. You, you have an expectation of what happens if you, if you invest more, and it's just not worthwhile, given the, whatever is the, 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 the equilibrium strategies. But now, because you have irreversibility, you know that they can't eat too much. Uh, because they, they, you know, there is this constraint that says that you can't go below that. This is a bad thing for the planner, because the planner is choosing in a time-consistent fashion, but from in equilibrium, this investment was inefficient. So now having a constraint that says you can't do it is actually a good thing. Is it going to be a, like a commitment device? So this means that introducing this constraint, even if the constraint is out of equilibrium, is going to change your expectations about what's happening in the future, and this is going to raise your, your expected value function. Uh, but then you have a ripple effect, because at this point, if it is not an equilibrium close by, close here, then all this is destroyed. And this is going to be true even if this is not zero, but is positive, uh, because when this is positive, you're going to have something like this, 45 degree line, some investment. Now, now you have 1 minus d, g is here, is out of equilibrium, and then at some point you, you say you arrive to the constraint and then you need to satisfy it. At this point, you have the same pro problem you have there. Here you have uh, that uh, the, the constraint is going to increase your expectation. This is going to have a ripple effect out of equilibrium, but this is going to destroy the entire equilibrium. This is the reason why you have a subset of uh, equilibrium uh, with, uh, with this irreversibility. Um, now, why, why for a planner this is not a problem? Well, because for a, a planner is choosing a time-consistent solution. So essentially, this is the value function with reversibility. If you introduce the constraint here, where the planner will have to satisfy it, and now it's going to do a little worse because it needs to satisfy this additional constraint. You're going to have a kink here, and, and it's going to fall down, but this is just a downward kink. In equilibrium, if you introduce this constraint, because this is actually a good thing in equilibrium, it's going to create a, non, a point of non-concavity. It's going to have a problem like this, and this is not going to be an equilibrium anymore. All right, so then how, is the equilibrium, uh, how does the equilibrium look like? Um, well, uh, so the problem here, you see, you are arriving to the, st to, the, to the constraint too fast. So, but now, with the construction we have done before, because we have this flat plateau, the, the, the value function is flat, and we can actually approach, we have degrees of freedom, freedom of, about choosing how, uh, how fast you are approaching the constraint, we can actually construct an equilibrium where you, in fact, you arrive at the constraint in a very smooth way. And so, in fact, you land on the constraint with the same derivative. So, in fact, the constraint is not going to matter because you're, you have already internalized the effect of the constraint in the previous behavior. And so, basically, in fact, you can prove that there is, there is a unique concave equilibrium. Uh, and, uh, and, in fact, even proving existence in this case is very hard because, you see, you need to have this flat value function in order to fine-tune the speed at which you arrive to the constraint. Otherwise, you can't do it. Um, so, but you can do it, uh, you can construct this equilibrium where you arrive there. Now, is this the only equilibrium? Well, we don't know because this is the only concave equilibrium, but we don't know if there are other, other equilibria that are non-concave. In fact, almost surely there are other equilibria that are not concave. So the question is, does it matter? And so the next result I'm going to show is that <laughs> uh, um, um, as delta goes to 1, as d goes to 1, so it uh, goes to 0, sorry, as d goes to 0, so basically when there is little depreciation, uh, then the entire set of whatever equilibrium, concave or not concave, it doesn't matter. The steady state converges to one point, which is the upper bound of the, the set that we characterized before with reversibility. So just to give you an example, as d goes to, to 0, this is going to be the only equilibrium with irreversibility, and this is the entire set here uh, of equilibria with reversibility. <laughs> and this set could be huge. Because as, as delta goes to 1, this goes to infinity. So these are really, re there is a really big difference between the best equilibrium and the worst equilibrium w for an economy with patient agents. All right, so I don't have a lot of time. So I just want to just briefly, have, I have a slide about non-monotonic strategies and cycles. So what happens when you, uh, so as I said, 
uh, these results are for non-monotonic equilibria. That is where the value function is non-decreasing, sorry, not the value function, the, the investment function y of g is non-decreasing in g. But you can have equilibria where y of g is actually can be decreasing, it can be non-monotonic. This equilibria, in terms of the steady states, they just add some bad, some bad low level steady states. But they are interesting in terms of the convergence path because you can have steady states with damped oscillations. So basically, in which you have situations where um, you, 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 you arrive, so this is, you arrive to the steady states in this way. So you kind of circle around it. And in fact, we have an, uh, uh, a closed form solution of an, an example, uh, which is generic, where you have uh, um, no, no, no stable steady state, uh, and you have a cycle where you cycle forever uh, with an orbit of two. So basically, this is an economy, as I said, with no shocks whatsoever, but in where you can find an equilibrium where these guys keep increasing, decreasing g forever. Um, which is also quite interesting, and um, I don't think uh, we are not aware of other results of like this in the context of these free rider problems. All right, so let me conclude. So, what we have done, we have taken a pretty straightforward model of free riding uh, with uh, n agents. Uh, we have considered two types of economies with reversibility and irreversibility. With, irre with the reversibility, where a continuum of steady states. Um, uh, Best equilibrium increasing in n, so more people, the better. Worst equilibrium decreasing in n, outer key in the middle. Um, best equilibrium converges to the, the efficient steady state as delta goes to 1. With their irreversibility, when depreciation goes to 0, only the, the best equilibrium is an equilibrium, which means that if you have small depreciation, then uh, the, basically all equilibria will be approximately efficient for high discount factors. Uh, there are also non-monotonic equilibria, and there are equilibria with limit cycles, so no stable steady states as well. That's it. Thank you. Yes. Question. Your notion of, of, of convergence is based on the steady state. Convergence. When you had the reversible case, you said, look, when, when, sorry, when, when the precision goes to zero, the steady state of the uh, irreversible case and reversible case are the same. No, 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 no. When depreciation goes to zero, so when depreciation goes to zero, the irreversible is a set, still a set, it remains a set. The irreversible the it, it shrinks to the, a singleton, which is the maximum of the irreversible. Okay, but that's on the steady state. Right? Yeah. So do you, do, have you compared the path? No, uh, yes, okay. So there could be multiple. Or, or, or the no, no, no. Uh, the, the path is the same. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The path for, for this equilibria is the same. Uh, in some sense, you can see it from, from this picture. You see, okay, look at this thing. This is an equilibrium with irreversibility, but this could be an equilibrium with reversibility as well. In fact, uh, any equilibrium with irreversibility is an equilibrium with reversibility as well. Uh, because it doesn't really happen, what, it doesn't really matter what happens here for reversibility. So you can have, but uh, you know, we have a result in the previous version of the paper. Uh, I think we still have uh, the, uh, the, the, the working paper somewhere. Uh, we had results about the uniqueness of this for concave equilibria. But you can't prove uniqueness in general because you could have equilibria that are non-concave and so you have more weird behavior here. The, the, the cool thing about the results is that you can prove things in general for the steady states. So. The, but, but the cycles are possible only with, the, with, the, with no monotonic equilibrium. Though you could have cycles also with irreversibility because, for example, when, when D goes to zero, so when depreciation goes to one, the two cases are very similar. They, they just, so. Sorry, Mark, when you talk about symmetric equilibria, so all the results about all the equilibria doing something, is it, are you assuming symmetric or? No, it just, uh, it just, uh, I'm focusing on symmetric equilibrium. I'm not assuming it. Um, <coughs> this is really not, with no loss of generality. The, the only difference, you can imagine what the complications would be to consider asymmetric equilibria. Uh, uh, you would uh, now have a, a system of differential equation to characterize the, the flat region. Uh, if you have an asymmetric environment, you would have to do it. But in this case, it, it, but you could have asymmetric equilibria as well here. In this case, the the, the, the system of differential equation will give you a flat region in the space of all the value functions, and then you can play around there. 
who knows what you can do there. Well, because with asymmetric echolibrar, you can get something interesting like subset of the agents contributing and sub subset of them not. Right? Well, this is interesting up to some point. In the sense, we know that you can do these things. Uh, so, yeah.